I want to also thank very much the um, Training for Peace uh, uh, program and the Nordic African Institute for this initiative uh, in convening this uh, important uh, conference. And it's particularly timely for three main reasons in my view. First, that we now have uh, the Secretary General of the UN, Ban Ki-moon, who has established uh, a high-level panel to do a strategic assessment of United Nations uh, peacekeeping operations, sort of a Brahimi II. Uh, and so this uh, gathering, coming as it is, in effect uh, will have an impact uh, on some of the uh, considerations, I hope, uh, by this UN uh, um, strategic assessment of his peacekeeping operations. But coming nearer home, I think this conference is timely because it will also contribute to what I still hope will be a decision by the AU Commission to actually establish its own um, assessment uh, panel uh, on the experience of the African Union, or even going back to the OEU's uh, experience in peacekeeping uh, operation. Incidentally, the idea of this assessment by the AU uh, was contained in the report which was uh, published uh, or at least uh, submitted by the uh, African Standby Force assessment, assessment Team, which I had the honor to, uh, to co-chair uh, with Cedric. Uh, but that recommendation has not been taken up yet. I hope it still will. And I believe that if it does, it will really benefit from uh, what I sincerely hope will be a rich discussion uh, emanating from this uh, gathering. But a, th a third reason is that the UN, um, which loves anniversaries, by the way, will turn 70 next year. And, um, and that will be an opportunity for the UN to reflect on several aspects of its work, not least of which is peace and security and also the post-2015, and reestablish this nexus between peace development and uh, human rights and democratization. And it's, it's no accident, in my view, that the major seminal reports by the United Nations on the nexus between peace development and democratization were produced by Secretary General, both of whom were Africans. Uh, Brutus Ghali had, if you recall, the agenda for peace, in which he argued uh, persuasively, in my view, that there can be no development without uh, peace. And he followed it by a second report, uh, an agenda for development, in which he argued that there will be no durable peace without sustainable development. And Kofi Annan had a third report in which he argued that there will neither be peace nor development without respect for human rights and people being given a, a, a chance to, uh, to live under the government of their, of their choice. So I think these kinds of assessment by the Ban Ki-moon panel, uh, the conferences such as this will contribute to what I, I, I'm sure will be a rich discussion next year. Incidentally, I've been asked not to stand up like my distinguished uh, uh, colleagues who spoke before me in, in deference to the African tradition of respect for old age, <laughs> since I turned 70 last uh, month. So, um, and uh, so, uh, I thank you for, the, for, for this uh, exception uh, to the rule. Um, now, I really welcome this very distinguished uh, gathering of African scholars, uh, intellectuals, and friends and scholars from outside the continent uh, who have been reflecting upon and publishing their thoughts on the African condition in all its aspects and helping to chart the way forward. I think this is a un unique opportunity for us to actually come to some con concrete uh, 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 recommendations that will truly move the continent forward in the challenges facing it in the peace and security <laughs> area especially. I'm delighted to share my thinking this morning on the theme of this gathering, which is the future of peacekeeping in, in, uh, in Africa. Now, distinguished ladies and gentlemen and, and friends, the context of peacekeeping in Africa has dramatically changed, especially in the last 11 years. The traditional notion of peacekeeping, as you are aware, was based on the interposition between warring parties, often between two states, so essentially dealing with uh, interstate uh, conflicts. This pattern of traditional UN peacekeeping has evolved to include perilous and discouraging enforcement actions and other forms of multilateral coalition. Also, there has been the development of peacekeeping operation uh, for the protection of civilian populations, 
uh, and also the concept of uh, R2P, the responsibility to protect. These various scenarios were all underpinned by the principle of consensual peacekeeping based on sovereign autonomy as an important principle for the preservation of global peace and security, the consent of the party, the consent particularly of the host uh, country was required. Now, in a more contemporary global environment, it is now accepted that threats to international peace and security are not limited to conflicts between states, but in fact more and more uh, to other forms of violent conflict involving especially non-state actors within states. Yet, the concept and practice of United Nations peacekeeping, except with some notable exceptions of peace enforcement, continues to be underpinned by the principle of impartiality, principle of neutrality, and principle of non-use of force, except in the case of self-defense. So the question of um, the future of peacekeeping in Africa must be understood against the background of lessons learned from the deployment of regional peace support operations led by the African Union, and its cooperation with the United Nations under Chapter 8 of the UN Charter. From this perspective, and without discounting the primacy of the UN Security Council, which in the Charter has primary responsibility for the maintenance of international peace and security, it is useful to establish close partnership with regional uh, institutions like the AU, uh, due to its doctrinal shift away from traditional principles of UN peacekeeping mission in order to effectively address the emerging unconventional security threats in Africa. In, in many ways, uh, I regard the uh, AU, and you might even go a step back to the um, uh, OEU that did peacekeeping in the Chad, for example, in the 1980s, uh, as really the, 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 um, the ones who uh, enunciated the concept of the coalition of the willing. The problem has been, for the most part, the AU or the AU may be willing, but often not always able to be able. In other words, not to uh, uh, have the capacity to do what it is that it wants to do. Now, since the establishment of the African Union Peace and Security Council, the primary decision-making organ for the prevention, for the management and resolution of crises in Africa, the AU has deployed, and please note this, has deployed more than 50,000 uniformed and civilian personnel to various peace support operations. 50,000, including, of course, UNAMID, which I had the, that's the United Nations African Mission in Darfur, which I had the honor to, uh, to head at its, at its height. It was the biggest peacekeeping operation in the world, international peacekeeping mission, with uh, 30,000 uh, personnel, 16,000 troops, uh, almost all of which are, of course, African. So that unlike traditional UN peacekeeping, these operations by the African Union have been characterized by at least five main peculiar features, and I would like to touch upon this. First, the mandate of, the, of most of these operations has included offensive operations beyond Chapter 7 of the uh, UN chapter. <coughs> charter. The latter is largely conceptualized in terms of defensive operations involving repelling possible attacks against UN personnel, government or allied personnel, and civilian population. In the case of the AU's own offensive operation, however, the use of intelligence and other forms of strategies for search for and defeat the enemy has been included as part of the AU rules of engagement. So much further than Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, much further than what uh, UN peacekeeping operations were prepared to do, uh, except, of course, in some recent cases where the UN has, in, like in the uh, DRC, has beefed off its offensive capability. But that is an exception that proves the rule of uh, UN peacekeeping operation. Second, the risk of regional insecurity of crisis has increased the likelihood of generating capacities from neighboring countries as major true contributing countries in AU peace operations. AU deployments in Somalia, in Mali, in Central African Republics, an example of the shift from deploying peacekeeping operations to save strangers uh, that characterize most UN peacekeeping operations to saving the neighbors, which has featured 
in AU-led peace support uh, operations. So like, see, Mali um, 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 uh, Chad is a neighboring country in a sense, uh, and uh, Burkina Faso and others. And so what happens there has immediate impact on neighboring countries, and that is an additional motivation for, for the will to try to contribute troops to AU uh, uh, peacekeeping, AU-led peacekeep, peacekeeping and peace support operations. Third point, there has been an attempt to build a multidimensional peace support operation through the AU. As the independent assessment of the African standby force alluded to, this process has achieved very limited successes because most UN operations, AU operations are still very military heavy with some police capacities and less so for the uh, civilian component. The civilian component being the poorest of the cousins, you know, in AU uh, peace operation. Uh, and, and I hope that uh, Yvonne, who is uh, on loan from, uh, from the African Union to ECOWAS, uh, will, uh, of course, uh, enlighten us more about how to actually enhance the civilian component as a critical uh, uh, component of uh, an emerging AU peacekeeping uh, uh, operations. So that to avoid a situation where peace support operations is construed uh, as a strategy for militarization of conflict resolution in Africa, it is crucial that the conceptualization of multidimensional peace support operations in Africa is strengthened. Fourth, and this is very important in my view, rapid in intervention is increasingly becoming an important need for peace support operation because there's very little value suddenly to uh, population that are sovereign to say we have an African standby force. But then when the need arises, we are unable to quickly deploy uh, uh, forces in order to meet the, the challenge. So rapid intervention within the AU context is currently limited to situations of genocide and other forms of mass atrocities. However, current forms of crisis in Africa has demonstrated that rapid intervention may be needed in cases that are not that extreme. In other words, in cases that do not strictly fall into the extreme form of violence, but where there may be a propensity that slow intervention may lead to large-scale violence against civilians. We've seen that in Mali. We've seen that in Central African Republic. It is with this spirit that the ASF assessment, the African Standby Force assessment, call for the immediate operationalization of the Rapid Development Capacity, RDC, of the ASF, and that the African capacity for the immediate response to crisis, ACIRC, is seen as a phase in the development of the RDC. In other words, in our view, as expressed in that report, uh, the uh, ACRC, what is it? How is it pronounced? ACAC. ASAC or ACAC. <laughs> it's not a substitute <laughs> at all for uh, the rapid deployment capacity of the African Standby for, but this should be a component of it uh, as a phase in the development of uh, the RDC. Finally, uh, it has become clear that the absence of the necessary political will for sustained resources by AU member states, the UN, and core non-African partners are the most consistent source of mobilizing resources for the deployment of AU peace support op operations. The resource factor has become a primary indicator for the ability of the African Union to sustain operations or to transform its operations to a UN peacekeeping mission. So I would like to devote the last bit of my presentation to the future of peacekeeping operations and what are the options for the future of peacekeeping uh, operations in the continent. Given the context presented above, the future of peace support operations we have to consider in my view, the following options. Number one, African institutions must be part of peace operations in Africa. It's, 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 it's almost uh, axiomatic or obvious that the geographical proximity and contextual understanding of the crisis in the continent means that African actors cannot be excluded from any strategy for effective conflict management in Africa. And, and I'm sorry to say, from my experience, 
what you think is should be given is not always the case. The um, UNAMID, the United Nations African Mission, um, African Union Mission in Darfur, to which I've referred and of which I had the honor to lead, as I mentioned earlier, is often seen by some people in New York as some kind of a nuisance, you know. Um, the African Union is really not supposed to be a partner, you know, equal partner. Um, as a matter of fact, some of the extreme uh, uh, anti um, um, a joint mission like the African Union mission, therefore, um, make fun of the acronym. You know, they, they don't call it United Nations African Union mission in the in therefore. They call it United Nations African mistake in therefore, which will never be repeated. And as you can see, tremendous reluctance for the United Nations to actually see the joint missions in Africa as a model with all its imperfections, but as a model to be improved upon, to be developed, and to be made operational uh, el elsewhere. And yet, how can you really resolve the challenges and meet the challenges of Africa without involving African institutions? And also getting African countries to put their feet in, in the fire and, and put their, uh, their, 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 their bunny where their, their mouth is when it comes to effective peacekeeping. Even though uh, this concept of involving African institutions is recognized within the context of Chapter 8 of the UN Charter, there has often been reluctance to strengthen this regional approach to crisis management. One of the most, in my experience in the UN, which is as ambassador and as a UN staff, uh, close to a quarter of a century, the most underutilized chapter of the UN is actually Chapter 8, which is regional arrangement, which should have been a, a, a partner. Chapter 8 is part and parcel or an extension of Chapter 7, but because Chapter 7 puts the primary responsibility for the maintenance of peace and security squarely in the hands of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the Security Council and therefore of the P5, or sometimes the P3, sometimes the P1, mm -hmm. there's a reluctance to really um, have power sharing. And this is uh, surprising because one of the prescriptions that the UN makes is power sharing. But there is very a great reluctance for power sharing when it comes to the UN itself uh, uh, with respect to involving uh, uh, African institutions and other regional um, um, uh, institutions. Second, UN support to AU peace support operation must be institutionalized and not ad hoc. The high intensity nature of AU peace support operations suggests that it has more comparative advantage to ensure immediate stabilization than the depart deployment of the normal, regular UN peacekeeping operations. Various models and forms of UN support and collaborations have been implemented. The models include the provision of UN soft support in terms of personnel and equipment, the utilization of UN managed trust fund for the AUP support operations, and as an exception, the use of UN assess contribution for AU peace support operations. If I were to be provocative, as I'm, sometimes I am, at least now that I'm also retired from the UN, I can even be more provo provocative, I will argue that the logic, put the logic to, to its conclusion. If the primary responsibility for the international peace and security in the world, you don't say with, ex with the exception of Africa, belongs to the Security Council, then uh, peacekeeping operations undertaken by the region should be seen as a work undertaken on behalf of the Security Council. And therefore, to ensure their effectiveness, clearly uh, some portion of assessed contribution ought to go into those peace, operation, peace support operations in Africa that are undertaken on behalf of <laughs> or in support of the mandate uh, of, uh, of, the, um, uh, of, of the Security Council. Now, the assessed contribution is the most assured, the most timely, but has been the most sustained form of support that guarantees continuity and effectiveness. Now, um, of course, we've, uh, the AU has uh, been a recipient of UN logistics support for its missions, particularly in Somalia, Amazon, through the establishment of something they call the UN Support Office to Amazon, UNSWA. Despite the political challenges in the institutionalization of the UNSOA, 
uh, for Somalia, that is, the model. The practices of AUP's support operation necessitates the conclusion that it is one of the most predictable form of continued AU peace support operation where necessary. So if we can get access contributions, perhaps the African Union will have to make do with the kind of support that the uh, uh, UNSOA provides uh, for, the, for the, the peacekeeping operations or peace operations in Somalia. The third scenario that I see um, and that I hope we'll be able to emanate from this conference is the um, conclusion that rapid intervention should be seen as a means to an end and not an end in itself. The, the, the timely um, delivery the, uh, the, of AUP's support operation is a driver for effective stabilization. The apparent contestation between the uh, African standby force own rapid deployment capacity and the ASEC is therefore both misplaced but also a major political and operational inhibitor to rapid de uh, deployment. The priority for regional organizations as well as for the EU is to develop the capacity for rapid deployment with the overriding political will for, for, to deploy such capability. In this regard, the emerging focus of ASAC must be seen, as I mentioned earlier, as a phase of the RDC, a phase, not a substitute for, not in contestation with, but the ultimate goal of protecting civilians, restoring state stability, and promoting stability and re uh, reconciliation. Finally, African resources for African problems. The rhetoric of African solutions to African problems have not always been or have rarely been matched by the political realization of generating resources, especially financial, in addressing African crises. We found that uh, during the um, assessment uh, mission that we had, the ASF uh, assessment, in West Africa, ECOWAS moved a little bit uh, forward in, in uh, establishing a proportion of their regular budget to be devoted to uh, peace operations. Now, it's very important, in my view, that the African Union has to go that way and to earmark part of its, uh, um, uh, of its uh, regular budget and find new ways of generating revenue. I understand that um, uh, General Basunjo, uh, President Basunjo, uh, my own country's uh, former head of state, was chairing um, uh, a high-level panel to develop uh, alternative sources of funding for the AU in general, and we hope that, I mean, it's, we hope that part of that will be available for peace support uh, operations, but honestly, I don't know where that is, because there seems to be some, that seems to run into some opposition, and yet it's inevitable. They have to come back to uh, that, because uh, within a globalized world, African crises have important ramifications for international order. And therefore, notwithstanding, the development of an effective and enduring collective security regime in Africa can best be achieved through mobilizing uh, prompt and adequate resources from within African countries themselves. We cannot always continue to uh, assign responsibility for resources and financing of our own peace operation uh, and, and uh, uh, and, and subject this only to the goodwill of, of others. That is not serious, in my view. Uh, yes, the continent is, uh, um, is poor, relatively speaking, but some economies are doing better than others, and there's a possibility of being creative in obtaining resources in order to match uh, our needs. I believe that can be achieved uh, if the will uh, is there. Uh, and there are two types of realists. I think, I, I believe it was I can't remember who said it, that there are those who accept reality, and, uh, and that is the number. And then there are those who want to bend reality to, to a desired goal. And I hope that the African Union will follow the second, which is to bend the reality of uh, paucity of resources and really go for what is uh, actually absolutely needed, which is uh, really to put their, their, their money where their mouth is. Let me stop here. I hope I've been provocative enough. And I really wish that we will uh, have a very useful, very concrete, uh, very forward-looking recommendations because this will really, really help 
the future of peacekeeping operations in Africa and therefore uh, guarantee or help to guarantee the kind of peace and stability that is absolutely essential in order to be able to make um, uh, a, 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 a reality uh, this dream of Africa rising, uh, where uh, a, uh, Africa will be seen as a continent not dominated by crisis and conflict, but, but a continent uh, that is a major partner uh, in global economic and social development. I thank you very much. Thank you very much.